Good morning. There we go. We're on. <laughs> Good to see everybody this morning. <clears throat> we are doing a study on Hebrews. We're now up to chapter 4 uh, starting today. Um, I don't know. Pastor Jim is one of the teachers, BK. This has turned out to be a little harder study than what I originally thought it was going to be. I was like, oh, Hebrews, Hebrews, oh, the faith chapter. We, we all know about Hebrews. Now, it's, been, it's taken a lot more digging. It's, it's uh, been a little more challenging to try to break it down and to really understand uh, what it's trying to tell us. Yeah, so our lesson today is called Enter, Enter God's Rest. So before we get into that, um, I want to present a little scenario to you. What if I came to you and I said, hey, I have this beautiful estate in Hawaii. It's like 50 acres. It's got a private beach. There's a large main home. It's got multiple guest houses. Ah, there's a private chef. There's housekeeping services. Um, On-site amenities include things like a swimming pool, hot tub, horseback riding. And uh, because you are my friend, I'm going to invite you there for two weeks, you and your family. I'm not inviting the people that I don't know or just know me by name. They don't really know me. And I'm certainly not going to invite the people that have told me they don't like me and don't want to be around me. But I'm inviting you because you're my friends. And you don't have to do anything. It's all expenses paid. All you have to do is say yes and show up. You uh, don't even have to pack anything. Everything's going to be there. I'm going to make sure your rooms are prepared to your liking. All you've got to do is just show up and just rest and relax in this beautiful place. How's that sound? <laughs> okay. Some of you might say yes right away. <laughs> Why? Because you trust me because you do know me we do have a relationship we're friends and so you believe that okay this is this is this is something that's real that, that is open to me and some of you might say well, let me think about it it sounds too good to be true right there's got to be a catch to it it sounds too good to be true it, usually it is right it's usually how that works out and then some will just say no immediately like you know she's lying that's not true. That couldn't be for me. I'm just not even, not even going to entertain that thought. I'm not even going to pay any attention to it. Or maybe you're not even really my friend and you think, well, I can't go because I really, you know, I really don't even like her. She thinks I'm her friend. <laughs> but I'm really not. And even the ones who said yes right away might and over time find themselves backpedaling a little bit, kind of doubting the offer, kind of doubting that they will actually do it and you know they can come up with a lot of different reasons or excuses why you know like, like I said it's too good to be true there's got to be a catch I know I'm probably gonna have to go listen to some sales pitch about you know timeshares or something you know that's usually usually the thing or how does how does she have a place like that in Hawaii I mean we know her we know she, she works for Kanawha County Schools <laughs> she can't afford that <laughs> Uh, you know, so, or, no, I'm scared. I'm too afraid. I'm scared of flying. I, I just, I just couldn't do that. I can't go to Hawaii. They have giant spiders there. They have sharks. They have bugs. No, no. It's too hot there. I would be so uncomfortable. I just would be, feel out of place. I'd be uncomfortable. Oh, it's too far away from my family and friends. Oh, oh, I couldn't leave work for two weeks. I mean, I really appreciate the two weeks. I just, I just couldn't. Who take care of my pets, my plants? There might be some who say, well, I can't accept such a lavish gift. You know, you're going to have to let me give you something. I'm going to have to give you something for that. Let me give you some money on it. Let me pay for my airfare. You know, I'm going to have to, I want to give you something for it. I just can't accept that. And then there might be some that say, who, me? I don't, I don't deserve a trip to Hawaii. I mean, you know, I'm not. 
surely there's other people you know that need this worse than I do. Maybe you should let them have this gift. Or, I mean, I'm, I'm not ready for that kind of a trip. I mean, I'm going to have to lose 25 pounds before I even think about putting on a bathing suit. I just, you know, maybe, maybe next year if this rolls around, maybe I'll have lost those 25 pounds and I could do it then. Do any of those excuses sound similar to anything else to you? About why people aren't in church, why people aren't serving God? We can come up with lots of reasons, and they're on different levels. But have you ever passed up a blessing because you doubted it? But then you saw someone who didn't, and they said yes, and they just received everything that went with that blessing. But you missed it because you doubted and you fell short of that. When people hear the good news, they do have similar responses to this vacation scenario. When they hear the good news, they might say yes right away. Yes. And then some say, okay, I might have to, I'll think about this. Maybe, I'm just not sure I'm where I need to be yet. I, I, you know, surely I've got to do something. I've got to do something before I can accept this. I've got to change something here first. And then some just say no right away. They don't even want to listen. They don't, you know, they just reject the message altogether. It's a little like the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. Go to the next slide. It says, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the world, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. So what we've learned so far reading the book of Hebrews is that this is addressed to the Hebrew Christians, the people who had been Jewish and had become Christians. And they're at a point where they're considering going back. To Judaism. This has been very hard for them becoming Christians, serving Christ. So they are like that seed that fell on the rocky ground. They received it with joy. They had accepted this message of Christ. But then when trouble and persecution because of the world comes in, they quickly fall away. So they're at that point where they could fall away. You know, they, in their community, they were under a lot of pressure. The Jews, the ones that had stayed Jews that didn't believe Christ, hated them. They persecuted them. The Romans were not the nicest bunch to have to deal with either. So they were under a lot of persecution. And then on top of that, because this still was a fairly new thing, Christianity was a fairly new thing, the teachings of Christ were fairly new. There were many false teachers out there creating confusion. So it was just very difficult for them to stay rooted and so many of the Hebrew Christians found themselves slipping back into the familiar routines of Judaism the, the way they used to worship and the things that they the rituals and the, the things and it was familiar to them familiar means easy it's what you you know you can do it without thinking it just comes naturally because it's something you've, you've done over and over and they struggled with this new doctrine of grace was it too good to be true? You know, shouldn't they have to do something? Was the resurrection real? Was this promise of eternal life, was it real? So they were struggling with who they had been and who they were becoming, who they were now in Christ. And isn't that something that all new believers struggle with when they first come to know Christ? They struggle with who they were and then who they are becoming. 
you know, you become a new creature in Christ. But, you know, you're, you've changed, but, you know, you're still living in the same house. You're still interacting with the same people. You still have the same job. None of that stuff has changed, but you've changed. And so the struggle, that's where the struggle comes in. So how do you reconcile all that? How do you move forward and not fall back on your old ways? Well, that's only through Jesus, by staying close to Jesus. And so this is where the Hebrew Christians were. They're at this turning point uh, in their walk. They have one foot in the Old Testament and the other foot in the New Testament. And so the picture we have is that, you know, is, is we're following up what BK taught in Hebrews 3, where the writer warns them to not have a sinful or unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Otherwise, they could end up like the Israelites who wandered the desert and were not able to enter into the promised land. Remember, they wanted, they wanted to go back to Egypt. Well, that's exactly the same kind of scenario. You can, it's similar to what these Hebrew Christians were doing, wanting to go back to Judaism. It, you know, going back into Egypt meant going back into slavery. Going back to Judaism, rejecting Christ, meant going back to being under the law and all that came with that. Whereas they had had this freedom, they, had, they were under grace uh, with Christ. So this is where they're at, they're in kind of that turning point. You know, are they gonna continue in Christ or are they going to fall away? So let's look at Hebrews 4, chapter one. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. You know, no one wants to fall just short of their goal. They say, the saying goes, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. You've heard that, that saying. Um, but imagine, can you imagine running a marathon? I've got a picture here. Can you imagine running a marathon? I w couldn't even do a 0.11 of a marathon, okay? <laughs> if I am running, something is chasing me. So, <laughs> um, but can you imagine being a marathon runner and falling short of that finish line, not crossing it? This is Haley Carruthers. She was running the London Marathon when her legs gave out one meter short of the finish line. Can you imagine how devastating that would be? Now, some people might just say, oh, you know, I give up. You know, I, I didn't make it, I fell short. Fortunately, that's not the case with her. As you can see, she crawled that last meter to cross the finish line. Now, she by no means won the race. I think it said she was about an hour behind the woman who won for the women's uh, time. But this was actually her personal best time. But she was not going to fall short even though her legs gave way, she crawled the rest of the way in. And that's kind of the mindset we have to have, that we are not going to fall short, that we are going to hang on. We are going to hang on to Christ and just hang in there with all that we have. Um, but there are people that do fall short and just give up. So the writer is making the point to the Hebrew Christians that the promise of eternal, this eternal rest, this eternal life in Jesus, it's there. Um, we have to continue in faith no matter what we are facing. It's still there. The Israelites fell short from entering into the promised land, the original Israelites that left Egypt. God had promised this land first to Abraham and then to his descendants, Genesis 12:7. It says, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. So this was a promise. It was promised to them that this land was theirs. So there was no reason for them not to have it. The reason they fell short was because of them. It was because of their unbelief. And it's hard to believe, you know, Moses led them out of Egypt after all they had seen, you know, the river turning to blood the frog the frogs would have done me in y'all I'm sorry the frogs the locusts you know the darkness 
they heard the cries of the Egyptian parents uh, the night that the death angel came over. They had the blood posted on their doorposts, so they were safe. But they heard the Egyptian parents crying and wailing because they had lost their firstborn child. All of that that they had experienced and seen God do, they saw him open up the waters of the Red Sea to reveal dry land for them to cross over, then to close those waters back up on their enemies, to witness all of that. And then they get to where it's time to go into the promised land, and they see a few giants, and they see some fortified cities, and they go, nope, not going to do it. We're not strong enough. We can't do it. Well, the problem is they're saying we. We can't. Well, no, they can't. But God can. So, you know, they're like, no, let's go back. We're going to go back to Egypt. Yep, it's a terrible place, but, you know, it's familiar. It's comfortable. But do I want to do that? That looks hard. That looks hard. I don't think I want to do that. This was easy. I could do that. Been doing it that looks hard so that's a corner that every new believer has to turn is that you know I, I've got to know that I can't go back I can only go forward and I've got to trust God to do it so you have to say do do I really trust God or am I going to go back to my old ways I know what to do there I know how to act I don't know what it's going to be like going there but you've got to have faith. You've got to trust him. You've got to take root. Otherwise, it's going to come along and it's going to be taken from you. So Hebrews 4. Did I skip Hebrews 4 too, Jim? For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. So they... They didn't have faith, but the ones who obeyed, they did. Hebrews 4, 3 through 5. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God had said, has said. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Okay, so foreshadowing, I think most people know what that means. It's kind of like it's an example of what's going to happen in the future. So the Israelites going into the promised land and having a place that God prepared for them that, that was a place of rest, taking them out of this place of bondage they have been in, that's a foreshadowing of the work that Christ would do to make a place for us to rest in him. Okay? So the Israelites, um, they were promised this, and it, and it said that those that believed that entered, but there were some that he said, they will never enter my rest. Numbers 14.30, and this is what God is saying about the Israelites Remember, he sent out the ten spies, and eight of them came back and said, mm-mm, we can't do it, and they got the camp all stirred up. But there were two that said, we can do this. With God, we can do this. So he said, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. So only Joshua and Caleb had faith in God's promise to make it to the promised land. They were ready to go in and take what God had given them, and they would be the only ones from the original Israelites who left Egypt who would enter in. Not even Moses made it into the promised land. But because they believed they could enter God's rest, the unbelieving would never enter God's rest. It's because we believe. For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed, okay, it's about our faith. Hebrews 4, 6 through 8. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. 
This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken about later about another day. There's a lot of that. We could almost just spend a day on that. But we're not going to. <laughs> so the Israelites, with the exception of, of Jacob and Caleb, missed out. But their children, their, descend their descendants, the ones that were born in the wilderness, did receive it. And even then, you know, this, this is, you know, we're talking about two things. We're talking about them, people actually going in and possessing a land, and we're talking about um, eternal life with Christ. They did go in and possess the land, but that wasn't a final rest. If, if that had been the final rest, it said if Joshua had given them rest, then God wouldn't have spoken about another day. So eventually they all did die there, but it was then the promised land. God made a, a way, an even better way for us to rest because rest is not a place. For the Israelites getting into the promised land, that was finally getting away from Egypt, getting away from slavery, getting into the promised land where they could build their homes and have their families and live peacefully once they got it settled. That was a place. Well, that is just temporary. Rest is not a place. Some of you might think, I know Pastor likes his easy chair. <laughs> he talks about it. We all probably have a favorite place that we like to curl up and take a nap and, and try to, to rest a little bit. But rest is not a place. Rest is a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. We rest in Christ. You remember the Apostle Paul saying that he, had been, he could be content in any situation. It didn't matter if he was whatever, if he was in jail or if he was out preaching. He was content in every situation because he had the peace of Jesus. He had the peace of Christ. He was at rest in Christ wherever he was at. So rest is a person, not a place. So God had made a better way, and it says it still remains for some to enter, and that's us. And that's for the unsaved that are still out there. There is still a place for some there is still time for some to enter, and that time is today. Um, you know, we have that rest now in Christ as we're still here, and then we're going to have the even better rest when we leave this world and we go to be with him eternally. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, uh, verse 2, the second half of it says, I tell you now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. You know, he called it today. Today is the day to say yes, you know, to that offer, to the good news. Not to say, maybe I've got to think about it, or no. You know, he told us, don't harden your hearts, because unbelief is what kept the Israelites from receiving the promise. So once you've heard the good news, the message of salvation, you can't unhear it. You've heard it. You've got to do something with that. You've got to make a choice. Yes, maybe, no. Well, yes is the answer. Because if you say maybe, then you may put it off a day that's a day too late. Today is the day of salvation. Hebrews 4, 9 through 11. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. So, this is talking about when God rested. You know, and we read about that in Genesis, in the creation. He completed his work, and on the seventh day, he rested. That meant that he, was, he stopped his works. 
he rested from his works. When we enter into his rest, when we receive Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross, he said, remember he said it is finished? Isn't that when it's done? You finished your work? It is finished. It, it was time to rest, to not continue in works. To be in rest in Christ and his salvation means that works are no longer the basis of our righteousness. Not that they ever were. But don't most people, especially you know, if, if they are not Christians or immature Christians, they tend to lean on their works, their own works of righteousness. Well, I'm a good person. You know, I always take food in for the food drives. I volunteer at the animal shelter, and I always put money in the Salvation Army bucket. You know, I, I do good things. I let people go with the stop sign. I'm a good person. I'm not mean to anybody, and that's good. We should all strive to be good people and do those things. But those are not the things that make us righteous. Those are not the things that save us. Those are not the things that will allow us to enter into that rest. That's not what it takes. It's the blood of Christ. It's our faith in the good news that Jesus died for our sins and has redeemed us. It is a free gift. We don't have to say, let me give you some money on that trip. I need to give you something for that. Or, uh, I did this, I don't deserve this. We have grace under Jesus Christ. Um, the com I had read a commentator that wrote, God rested from his works on the original Sabbath of Genesis 2-2 because the work was finished. We cease from our self-justifying works because Jesus finished the work on the cross. Most people are familiar with this verse from Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So our good works do not save us. They are not what saved us. But once we are saved, God uses us to do good works that he has prepared, the good works that he wants us to do, the good works that build up his kingdom, not ours. Right? So, <clears throat> you know, there are, there are people who think, I've done too many bad things. For me to come to church for God to even consider me to be savable well it's not your good or bad behavior that counts it's accepting the salvation of God through Jesus Christ that matters when we repent and we accept then we can enter that's how we enter God's rest so the writer is telling this Hebrew audience don't miss out. And this is what we need to be telling people. Don't miss out. Don't be disobedient. Don't be hard-hearted like the Israelites who missed out on the promised land. So he keeps using them as an example because they would know who these people are because they are, are Jewish. A Gentile audience wouldn't necessarily understand this message. Hebrews 4, 12 through 13. It's like, aha, this is a verse. I, I've heard this verse a lot. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him whom we must give account. Because God is alive, his word is alive. And this word can cut. It goes right to the heart of the matter. Whatever our trial, our tribulation, our doubts, whatever it is that's on our heart, the, the secret thoughts that we don't share with anyone, God knows them all. 
It's all laid bare before his eyes. There is nothing that you can hide from him. It cuts, and it's a double-edged sword. It cuts both ways. And as a teacher, I can tell you that it does. It cuts both ways. It cuts coming out. Because I have to eat it first. Okay? It cuts coming out, and I have to give it to you, and it's going to cut you, and I want it to cut you. I want it to cut you. I want you to bleed because I want you to know how serious it is and how important it is. It cuts both ways. Nothing is hidden from God. These Hebrews were doubting. They were considering rejecting Christ and going backwards, going back to where they came from. And God knew it. He knew their hearts. And that's exactly why he sent this word through whoever this writer was. He gave this word to this writer of Hebrews to warn them against this because he knew their thoughts. He knew where their hearts were. He also knew what they were struggling with. He knows our thoughts. He knows our hearts. And he will send a word because this word is alive. Somebody could teach this passage of Scripture in a couple of weeks, and they will have a totally different take on it, different message, because that's how this word is. That's why it's alive, because it does have so many meanings. It is double-edged. It can cut different ways. He knows our weaknesses, and he sends his word to teach us, to comfort us, to encourage us, not to beat us down, but to encourage us. So if you're ever sitting under some teaching or listening to a sermon and think, how does, how does that person know? How could they know? They are, they're, this is totally about me. Who's been, who's been spreading my business? Well, God. That's who. Because it is for you. Could be for more than one. Could be for all. But it's, it, is, it is for all of us. That person doesn't know, but God does. Verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You know, to the Jews, the high priest was the highest religious authority. You know, to the Catholics, it's the Pope, right? To the Jews, it was the high priest. And they understood the role of the high priest as that mediator between them and God. He was the one who entered the Holy of Holies once a year to atone for the sins of the nation. So... Now we have this description of Jesus as the great high priest because he exceeds the earthly high priest. Remember what we started with? Jesus is better. So this is bringing up this, this um, letting them know that as high priest, Jesus is better. You know, the, the high priest, the Jewish high priest, entered the Holy, Holy of Holies. Jesus entered heaven. He ascended into heaven. The high priest, he was supposed to be, <laughs> that didn't always was the case later on in the years, but he was supposed to be a son of Aaron. Jesus was the son of God, or is the son of God. So again, better, greater. The high priest had to go every year annually to make the sacrifice, to make the atonement every year for the nation. Jesus did it once, and he did it for all. So Jesus is the greater high priest. And because of this, this is why we can stand firm in our faith, because we have a better high priest in Jesus than they had in the high priests that they would find in Judaism. Not only he, has he atoned for our sins, but he understands our weaknesses. He is, he is a loving God. He is not a someone who's going to beat you over the head with a hammer kind of God. He is a loving God. He understands the weaknesses. He came and became flesh, and he experienced the emotions, the temptations, 
The only difference is he did not sin. Okay? He never sinned. No other high priest could say that. Could any high priest say that they had never sinned? No. Jesus is better. So the writer is telling those on the fence, those Hebrews, he's saying, stay the course. Remember that Jesus is better. He is the better high priest. And because of Jesus, because of the relationship you have, you can approach God's throne of grace with confidence. You can trust that he is going to be merciful. You can trust in his grace. Uh, whatever trouble you're having, whatever persecution you're falling under, don't be discouraged by the people around you. You're going to find the grace and mercy and help that you need in your time of need. But you have to keep on with Jesus. There are times in our life when we feel like the Hebrew Christians. We get discouraged. We go through times of doubt. Sometimes we feel like we have failed or we're not good enough or not deserving. But you know, we struggle to live out the things that we believe. But don't give up. Don't go back to our old ways. There's a song we sing, I never want to go back to my old life. I never. There's, as Trish said the other night, there's nothing there. Why would you go back there? There's nothing there. We can only go forward in Christ. Don't miss out on the blessings and the rest of God. Luke 9:62. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. This is the mistake that the Israelites made. They looked back. They wanted to go back. They didn't want to go forward. They didn't want to trust in God. You, today is the day. We can enter God's rest. We can have it now, and then we can have it eternally when we leave this world and go to be with him forever. So that's the message that the writer in Hebrews is, is giving uh, these Hebrew Christians in chapter 4. Don't miss out. Don't miss out. And we're going to see in the upcoming chapters, they're going to expand more on talking about Jesus as the high priest. So that's if you want to read ahead, that's going to be the things that we're going to be looking at in the next few chapters.